The Confederate batteries began answering the federal guns at about 2 p.m. on Tuesday, July 1st, 1862, marking the start of the Battle of Malvern Hill, also called in some southern accounts the Battle of Poindexter's Farm. The Battle of Malvern Hill would be the final clash of the Seven Days Battles and the climax of the entire Peninsula Campaign. The guns of the left grand battery opened up first. The leadership crisis in the Confederate right delays the deployment of the guns of the right grand battery. When the Federal artillery officers see the Confederate guns unlimber on the Poindexter farm, they immediately switch their harassing fire to the rebel artillery crews. It is testimony to their skill and battlefield experience that the southern artillery crews on the left flank can stand up under such fire. Their initial performance is impressive. They quickly find the range of the enemy targets and put out hot counter-battery fire. The shells from the rebel guns produce considerable casualties among the Federal artillery crews and compels some Yankee officers to pull back their exposed infantry. The artillery duel between the left grand battery and the Federal guns atop Malvern Hill reaches its peak about 2.30 p.m. Since they lack any support from the right grand battery, the guns on the Confederate left initially take the full brunt of the Federal batteries atop Malvern Hill. Solid shot from Yankee smoothbore and rifled artillery sells over Western Run and lands directly on the three rebel batteries that had moved into position. The Federal artillery fire smashes gun carriages and it kills and wounds horses and men. The Confederate left grand battery, despite the valor of the gunners, is of the most farcical nature, wrote D.H. Hill. The Staunton, Virginia artillery is the last battery to retire on the Confederate left. Its commander, Captain William L. Baltus, who is struck by seven shell fragments during the artillery exchange, urges his men to stand up to the storm of Federal shells as long as possible. When his battery runs out of ammunition, he gives the order to withdraw. Beginning at about 2.30 p.m., the first batteries in the Confederate right flank attempt to go into action. The Federal artillery crews, particularly those in front of the crew house, turn their guns on the new threat. The Federal artillery fire against the right grand battery is so fierce that no battery can stay in action for long. Captain Greenlee Davidson, commanding the Ledger artillery, discovers that his Virginia battery can stay in action by having crews load the guns behind the crest of the hill. Once loaded, the men run the guns to the crest, fire them, and run them back down the hill to reload. Eventually, Captain Davidson also gives up the mismatch contest. After 3.30 p.m., other batteries in the Confederate right try periodically to go into action, but they are driven away almost immediately. The performance of the Federal artillery atop Malvern Hill is flawless and would be remembered by the Confederates long after the battle is over. Federal gunboats participate in the bombardment in the early afternoon, but their rounds fall indiscriminately on both blue and gray soldiers. Brigadier General Porter is furious over this and sends orders via the Signal Corps for the ships to cease their fire. The balance of Uji's division, which consists of Brigadier General William Mahone's Brigade of Virginians and Brigadier General Robert Ranson's Brigade of North Carolinians, arrive on the Carter Farm at about 3.30 p.m. Uzi chooses not to lead them to the front, but instead remains at the junction of the Long Bridge Road and the Carter's Mill Road, sulking about how Lee has circumvented him by issuing orders directly to his troops. When Brent finally locates him, Uji acts in a truculent manner. Brent tells the South Carolinian that Magruder wishes to align his units with Uji's division when it arrives and asks Uji where his men are deployed. Some of my troops have been moved without my knowledge by others independent of me, and I have no further information enabling me to answer your inquiries, says Uji. While Uji bickers with Brent, Armistead and Wright have watched Yankee skirmishers from Charles Griffin's 2nd Brigade of Morrell's 1st Division walk slowly down the slope of Malvern Hill towards their position. Their purpose is to try and shoot some of the artillerymen manning the Confederate guns. To counter the threat, Armistead decides to launch a limited attack to drive away the skirmishers. For the mission, Armistead calls up his three best regiments, the 14th, 38th, and 53rd Virginia. The soldiers in his brigade have been waiting in the woods behind the ridge where the rebel artillery has gone into action. When the three regiments are in position, Armistead puts his hat atop his sword and waves it in a circle as a signal for them to advance. At about 3.30 p.m., the Gray Infantry sweeps over the ridge with their weapons at the trail arms position. Once over the hill, they charge the Federal skirmishers, who, realizing they are heavily outnumbered, and quickly fall back towards their main line. During the charge, we encountered a red-hot storm of every missile, wrote Colonel Harrison Tomlin of the 53rd Virginia. Armistead's men advance about 500 yards, farther than Armistead had intended before halting to take cover in a shallow depression at the base of Malvern Hill. 
Armistead has only deployed them to drive the skirmishers off, but the colonels leading the three regiments think he means for them to charge the main federal position. Unfortunately for the Confederates, they quickly become the primary target of the federal artillery. Armistead, realizing that they would be chewed up badly if ordered to retreat, decides to lead them in position until the general assault begins, at which point they can join it. The three regiments would subsequently remain in position for nearly two hours under heavy fire. We held our position through all the storm of canister and shell, wrote Colonel Edward Claxton Edmonds of the 38th Virginia. While the Virginians are hunkered down at the base of Malvern Hill, General Lee is once again in the saddle. He rides with an escort beyond the Confederate left to reconnoitre the Federal position on the east side of Malvern Hill and determine whether it might be carried by a flank attack. If he feels it is feasible, he would order Longstreet and AP Hill to strike the Federals in the flank either that evening or perhaps the following day. What he finds is the bulk of the Federal Army in a strong position. The ground is also marshy where Western Run joins Turkey Island Creek. Lee's reconnaissance puts an end to any thought of turning the Union right flank. By 4 p.m., the general mood among the high-ranking officers of the Confederate left, including Jackson, D.H. Hill, and Whiting, is that there will be no major attack on the Federal position this day because it is too strong. All present have just borne witness to the skill of the Federal gunners, and it is probably clear to them that the Federals are eager for revenge following their series of humiliating retreats over the previous week. Major General Magruder arrives at the front about 4 p.m. by the way of the Carter's Mill Road in advance of his troops and makes his own assessment of the situation. When Prince John Magruder sees how far Armistead's men have advanced, he mistakenly interprets it as a small success. When Lee returns from his reconnaissance of the Federal right flank, he receives a dispatch from Magruder informing him that Uji's troops have achieved a promising success that Magruder plans to exploit if possible. Lee also receives word from Whiting that some of the Federal troops on Malvern Hill are moving back, which Whiting misinterprets as the beginning of a general withdrawal. Whiting's erroneous observation is probably derived from his seeing some of the Federal infantry taking cover during the brief bombardment by the Confederate left Grand Battery. Although Lee may be contemplating calling off the attack due to the fact that the artillery has failed to achieve any noticeable success, he texts these reports as good omens. Hoping that Magruder can expand on whatever success has been achieved by Armistead on the other end of the battlefield, Lee sends a dispatch to Magruder with the following order. General Lee expects you to advance rapidly. He says it is reported that the enemy is getting off. Press forward your whole command. Magruder is prepared to hurl six infantry brigades at the Federal lines in his initial assault. His plan calls for using four brigades of Uji's division and two brigades from Brigadier General David R. Jones' division. But when Magruder sends orders to Uji's other two brigadiers, Mahone and Ransom, Ransom refuses to move unless Uji orders him to do so. Since Uji is nowhere near the front, this proves impossible. When Magruder rides back to the Carter farm to bring forward Jones' division, he comes upon his own division at the front of the column of troops. Magruder's division comprises the brigades of Brigadier Generals Hal Cobb and William Barksdale. Prince John orders them to prepare to assault the federal position. He also gathers Mahone's brigade. Unlike Ransom, Mahone is more than willing to put his troops in the fight with or without Uji's permission. By 4.45 p.m., Magruder sends one of his aides to right with orders to charge the Federal guns by advancing to the right of Armistead's already committed troops. Shortly afterward, Magruder sends Mahone to follow right to add weight to his attack. Meanwhile, he sends Cobb forward on the same path as Armistead's three regiments have taken. Barksdale's Mississippians are farther back and go forward in a later wave. Magruder's first wave is only half the number of men he had originally intended. Some of the brigades Magruder orders into battle that day become pinned down immediately by the Federal guns. Others push forward unsupported on either flank, which is the case with Wright's brigade in the first wave. At every step my brave men fell around me, but the survivors press on until we had reached a hollow about 300 yards from the enemy's batteries on the right wrote General Wright. Bluecoats from the 4th Michigan of Griffin's Brigade try to get around Wright's left flank and cut him off, but Wright sees his threat and orders the 3rd Georgia on the brigade's left flank to change front and engage the Federals. For nearly an hour, Wright's Brigade fights Federal infantry in the vicinity of the slave cabins on the crew farm. During this time, it suffers heavy casualties from canister fire by a battery of 12-pounder Napoleon smoothbore cannons 
led by 1st Lieutenant Adelbert Ames of Battery A, 5th U.S. Artillery. When Wright's brigade goes forward, the Confederates of Armistead's brigade, who had been pinned down by Federal artillery, rise up and with a cheer resume their advance of Malvern Hill. They make a valiant attempt to reach the Federal line to no avail. Six times was the attempt made to charge the Federal batteries by regiments of Armistead's brigade, and as many times did they fall for want of support on their left, Colonel Emmons of the 38th Virginia wrote in his reports. The carnage among the 38th Virginia exemplifies the severe casualties suffered by the men who charged into the teeth of the Federal guns. Before the day is over, eight color bearers of the 38th Virginia are either killed or wounded trying to carry the regiment's colors forward. The lack of support noted by Edmonds is soon to be corrected. By 2 p.m., DHL has received Lee's orders pinned by Chilton. When the Confederate artillery bombardment proves to be a resounding failure an hour later, Hill sends a note to Jackson, under whose command he has been placed, asking Stonewall whether his five brigades should participate in a subsequent charge against the daunting Federal position. Jackson's response is that Hill is obligated to follow Lee's orders since they have not been rescinded. Hill and his subordinates are thinking about where they will camp for the night when several brigades to the right emerge from the woods and with a rebel yell begin advancing rapidly up the long slope of Malvern Hill. Bring up your brigades as soon as possible and join it, Hill says to his brigade commanders. The first wave of Major General Hill's attack consists of two brigades, Sam Garland's Brigade of the North Carolinians and John B. Gordon's Brigade of the Alabamians. The two brigades emerge from the woods at 5.30 p.m in one long line with Gordon on the left and Garland on the right. Garland's Tar Hills have to cover about 900 yards of open ground over neatly mowed fields to reach the Federal guns. About halfway to their objective, the artillery musket fire from the Union lines is so severe that the rebels halt, drop to the ground, and begin firing from the prone position, which is contrary to Garland's orders. I sent my acting aide de camp to inform Major General Hill that unless I was reinforced quickly, I could affect nothing and could not hold the position then occupied," wrote Garland. Cass's 1st Division is deployed facing northeast a few hundred yards in advance of the West House, and its soldiers are able to fire into Gordon's flank as he advances toward the crest of the hill. Cass has deployed two of his brigades in one line with another behind it in reserve. To engage the left front rank of Cass's division, which is held by Brigadier General Ennis Palmer's 3rd Brigade, Hill orders Colonel Charles C. Two to attack Palmer. Two has inherited command of George B. Anderson's brigade after Anderson was wounded in a skirmish leading his men across Western Run. Advancing on two's left is Brigadier General Roswell Ripley's brigade. General Hill orders his last brigade led by Colonel Alfred Colquitt to fall Gordon. The advance of the 8,200 Confederates in Hill's division worries General Couch. He asks Brigadier General Porter for assistance, and the 5th Corps commander sends word to Sumner that he needs two of Sumner's brigades immediately. Sumner sends Brigadier General John Caldwell's 1st Brigade of Israel B. Richardson's 1st Division at the double quick from the rear of Malvern Hill. Caldwell's Federals go into the fight on the far right of Couch's line. Sam Heinzelman, who's confirmed with Sumner when the request for support comes, volunteers to send Dan Sickles' Excelsior Brigade from his corps into the fight as well. Sickles' five New York regiments form up in a lane that runs behind the West House, where they can easily reinforce Couch's position. Some of Gordon's men come within 200 yards of the Federal guns, but Brigadier General John J. Abercrombie's 2nd Brigade of Couch's Division, which has been in reserve, shifts east to block Gordon's assault and support the artillery crews. On Hill's left flank, the Georgians and North Carolinians of Ripley's Brigade reaches the level ground at the crest of the hill, but they also receive double canister from level gun barrels that prevents them from advancing further. To Ripley's right, Two's brigade also receives heavy destructive fire from the menacing enemy cannon. Our men charge gallantly at them, wrote William Calder of the 2nd North Carolina of Two's brigade, noting the enemy mowed us down by the 50s. Time and time again, Hill's men rise up from the prone position and attempt another charge, but each time they are repulsed. We murdered them by the hundreds, but they again formed and came up to be slaughtered, wrote Lieutenant George Hager of the 10th Massachusetts of Palmer's brigade. Despite the approach of night, Magruder continues to gather troops to reinforce his attack. He rides back to the Carter Farm, where he finds Jones and McClaw's divisions approaching the front. Together they have four brigades, all which would go into the fight. Prince John isn't the only one looking for more troops to lead up the hill. 
D.H. Hill, who watches as wounded stream to the rear, also casts around for more troops to reinforce whatever success his division is having on the slopes of Malvern Hill. Finding the four Georgia regiments belonging to Brigadier General Robert Toombs' brigade, a Jones division without the commander, Hill leads them forward to support his division, even though they belong to Magruder's command. Meanwhile, Magruder puts Jones' other brigade, led by Colonel George T. Anderson, into action on the far right of the Confederate line in support of Mahone and Wright. The peaceful insertion of these Confederate brigades into the fight continues when McClaw's division arrives at the front. One of Magruder's aides breaks up McClaw's division, sending Joseph Kershaw's brigade of South Carolinians to support Hill and dispatching Brigadier General Paul Stone's brigade to support Magruder's command. As more Confederates join the assault on Malvern Hill, Fedge Artillery Reserve Commander Colonel Henry J. Hunt orders the 1st Connecticut Heavy Artillery to fire its 32-pounder siege guns at the Sea of Grey Infantry trying to take Malvern Hill. The big guns cut 10-foot swaths through the charging ranks with a single shell. Hunt also sees to the steady replacement of field batteries on the front line as they run out of ammunition and are withdrawn. By 7.30 p.m., Major General D.H. Hill has broken off his attack against the Federal right atop Malvern Hill, leaving two brigades from Magruder's command, those of Kershaw and Toombs, to carry out a desultory exchange of fire with the Bluecoats of Couch's division. Jackson has been watching D.H. Hill's division as it is mauled by Federal artillery and infantry. Stonewall's troops have waited to be ordered forward, but Jackson has no intention of hurling them against Couch's reinforced division. When Jackson sees Trimble preparing to lead his brigade against the Federal right, he inquires as to Trimble's intent. What are you doing, General Trimble? asks Jackson. I am going to charge those batteries, sir, replies Trimble. I guess you had better not try it. General Hill has just tried it with his whole division and have been repulsed. I guess you had better not try it, sir, Jackson says. The Confederate units near the crest of the hill make one last attempt to capture the Federal guns in front of them before darkness prevents further fighting. Wright's brigade have clung precariously to its position near the slave cabins of the crew farm for nearly two hours when it rises up from the hollow where it has sought protection from the hellstorm of canister and goes over the crest of the rise toward the guns on Morrell's left flank. Screaming out the rebel yell, they run headlong into a line of Federal infantry that has been waiting below the guns for just such a charge. Upon them we rush with such impetuosity that the enemy broke in great disorder and fled, wrote Wright. But the delay buys enough time for the Federal artillery to complete a withdrawal that is already underway to the crew house to prevent the guns from being outflanked by other Confederate regiments advancing obliquely on Morrell's left. Similarly, Kershaw's South Carolinians make a last assault astride the Quaker Road towards the Federal guns that are about 200 yards in front of the West House. They nearly overrun Captain John Edwards' Battery B, 3rd U.S. Artillery, but once again Yankee infantry holds them up long enough for the guns to be withdrawn. By 8.30 p.m., some of the Confederates moving up the hill have begun accidentally firing into the backs of fellow Southern soldiers in front of them. The Federal gun crews continue to load and fire into the gloaming until it is apparent that the Confederates have finally broken off their attack. When the guns fall silent, a steady chorus of cheers rise from the top of the hill as Federal troops celebrate their triumph that day. For the Confederates, it must have been a deeply disheartening moment as they reflect on the disaster that had befallen them and listen to the pitiful cries of their wounded comrades. The Battle of Malvern Hill ends with darkness shrouding over the battlefield, accompanied by the cries and moans of the wounded and dying sprawled across the field. Lee's Army in Northern Virginia at Malvern Hill has suffered roughly 5,500 casualties, while McClellan's Army of the Potomac have suffered about 3,200 casualties. Once the battle is over, Major General McClellan orders his army to retreat again under cover of darkness. It pulls back to Harrison's Landing, where it entrenches and is able to rely on the flotilla of gunboats for additional firepower. Lee instructs his army's cavalry commander, Brigadier General Jeb Stewart, to probe the Federal defenses at Harrison's Landing, and Stewart reports that he can find no weaknesses in McClellan's position. Fish John Porter has managed to preserve the Army of the Potomac's reputation at Malvern Hill. McClellan manages to keep his army at Harrison's Landing for six weeks while he pleads with Washington for more troops and mulls another advance on Richmond. However, it is not to be. A week after the battle, on July 8th, President Lincoln visits McClellan's headquarters at Harrison's Landing and, after inspecting the Army of the Potomac's situation personally, tells McClellan he wants the army to begin withdrawing 
off the Virginia Peninsula back towards Washington as soon as possible. George B. McClellan's Peninsula Campaign, which began with such promise in the early weeks of March, is finally over. On August 3rd, McClellan receives direct orders from the War Department to return his entire army by ship to Alexandria, Virginia. Despite his protests, McClellan's army is to unite with Major General John Pope's newly constituted Army of Virginia for an overland offensive through Northern Virginia. With the conclusion of the Seven Days Battles, General Robert E. Lee is propelled to national stardom throughout the Confederacy. In just under a week, Lee has managed to successfully force back McClellan's massive Army of the Potomac from the very gates of Richmond, completely outgeneraling the young Napoleon. The Southern press, which had been so critical of Lee after he assumed command in early June, now praises the general as a great hero of the South for his role in saving Richmond from the grips of the Union Army. But Robert E. Lee's career as commanding general of the Army of Northern Virginia has only just begun. As the weeks of July pass into early August, Lee will reorganize his army into two core-sized formation called wings, with Stonewall Jackson commanding the left wing and James Longstreet leading the right wing. After realizing that McClellan's Army of the Potomac is withdrawn from the peninsula, Lee will begin shifting his forces north to contend with the looming threat of Major General John Pope's Federal Army of Virginia in the next major campaign of that summer, the Northern Virginia Campaign.